What's happening, everybody? This is V3Cast, episode 22, the first one of 2023. What's happening, fellas? Good evening. What's up? up? Doing it to it, man. Going to hit this year running. We're going to make check marks on our list and get things done. Getting it done. That's right. Recording, (laughs) playing shows. We're writing a book. We're working on a new book. (laughs) We're reading books. (laughs) <laughs> skydiving oh man i am never jumping out of a perfectly good plane i'm so sorry about that uh i'm, I'm passing would you have that. done it like when you were 20 nope nope oh, per- perfectly good plane why would i jump out of it all right <laughs> a lot of people do it's it not natural. I, know, I know they do and good for them i would tell you what i would do though if i was if i was diving out of a plane I would be drinking a nice cool beverage all the way down. <laughs> I got to know what would you guys be drinking if you were jumping out of a plane? <laughs> it's a really rough segue, Steve. That's a pretty good one. He worked for that. Thanks, man. Yeah. You know, I, I take, I take what's out there and I try to mold it and make it something. That's right. All you always have, you've always been a hustler like that. Uh, for me, it's nothing fancy, just Modelo. All right, man. It's always glare city on that thing, man. Right there. Well, it's Modelo. a pure, pure white, shiny can, you know. Modelo. They should do a dark version of the they can. They do. They do. Oh, of the can. Yeah, they do. It's Modelo. I think it's Modelo dark. Well, or why, why, why the hell don't you get dark? Though it'd be more photogenic. Yeah. It I might not taste I'll good. I'll try it out. I'll try it out. What if I don't like the it? Podcast, Aaron. <laughs> what if I get a whole six pack and I don't like it? I'll just have to give it to Greg. Exactly. Yeah. You, you already have a, have a protocol uh, set yeah. up for if you don't like a beverage, you give it to Greg. Right. Just put it in that fridge down your basement. It'll get, it'll get gone. It, it'll get it. drunken. That's right. That's it right. might not be my favorite, but <laughs> I'll still drink it. I'll drink it. <laughs> Oh man, Greg, what do you got? I know you were you were talking earlier. You can't wait to crack into your beverage. So what is it? It's from your brother's hometown, Ryan Ryan Geist Brewery. Oh. This one's called Juicy Truth. I don't oh. think your brother's a big fan of theirs, but I'll tell you what, this one's pretty good. Let's get a little. Uh, oh yeah, did you get that? I, got I heard that. I don't I'm know. Um, that. let me get that packaging out and rustle that around a little bit. I don't know um, if he's heard of that one or not. What, Sam, you got to pipe in if you see this and, and let us know. Have you had that one? Is that one good? Or if not, get you some and then let us know if you like it. And if and you I'm don't like sure, it, give it to Greg. I'm pretty sure he has a bone to pick with this brewery. I don't know why that stuck in my head, but hmm. I remember talking to him at his wedding. He said something about Rheingeist. I'm not sure why. Maybe he liked it. I don't know. Okay. But anyways. Oh, well, let me turn that. Like he's around. got some or, personal business with them, like oh, personal, yeah, glass. personal, personal business. A that's a rubber. That's a rubber that's sole. That's glass. awesome. And also Is that a new logo on them. new glass there? No, I got a whole set of Beatles glasses. Oh, uh, well, I like that. Hey, you got to da. <laughs> you got to show those uh, next time because I would like you to do a series of them so I can. As I feel like I've, I feel like I've had them on before i know i've shown you the revolver one i must not have been there for that one i've got revolver <laughs> rubber sole well where Forget, the hell were you don't, don't reveal it <laughs> wait till we wait till next time so we can see them that's right yeah it'll be one episode at a time we unveil each of greg's <laughs> luscious beetles glasses <laughs> you can you can guess which is the next you know i've already given you two of them so well i would the think that two? abbey road would guess. be one of them abbey road no use in google either steve boom what are you uh, drinking White i Monster. got something fun man it's fun i found it uh where Bloody Mary. Is that? nino chauvagio's <laughs> virgil's handcrafted black cherry soda nice is it uh That's yeah you should for steve. check it out no but yeah You'll have to add sound to that too, because that was weird. Steve, how come you can never do the like, like ASMR? Tastes like I'm eating cherries. That's so good. Uh, is it cold? Mm-hmm. All right. Good. It's been in the fridge all day. All right. Oh, that's good. Oh, man. I, I thought that, it was in that your put out, some pep in your step. fridge. Oh, I love oh, I do that Steve's too. Steve's got an outdoor bar. Uh, yeah, it's got everything. And when we yep. come over to record, we... <laughs> everything's <laughs> just... outside. It's mm-hmm. outside and it's nice in winter time, so it's yeah. cold. And it's nature's free refrigerator. And there's a dude Cheers. out there. Um, it's the guy from The Shining, and he's just sitting yeah. behind the bar. 
Lloyd. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Lloyd. Yeah. <laughs> All right. One of our <laughs> featured topics of this <clears throat> podcast episode <clears throat> is our appreciation for Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, which yes. came out on June 4th, 1982, directed by Nicholas Meyer, music by James Horner. Oh, man. It's still, in my opinion, the best Star Trek that they've ever done. I love yeah, it. I'll watch I, it anytime. I, I will not argue. And that's saying a lot because there's other great Star Trek movies, but this is definitely has to be the best. And it's one of the best movies ever. It has <laughs> one of the old. most traumatic scenes in it. Oh, yeah. yeah. From my and childhood. Some people might not know this factoid as well, but it is actually a sequel, believe it or not. Uh, the original Star Trek series had an episode called Space Seed in 1967. And, uh, it introduced Khan uh, and played by Ricardo Montalban back then as well. The Wrath of Khan is a continuation of what happened in that particular episode. So check it out if you didn't know that. What's great about that movie is like we were all little little kids when we saw it. And when you're a kid, you you focus. We've talked about this before. You focus on if it's a horror movie, you focus on the scary stuff. If it's a science fiction movie, you're focusing on the lasers and stuff like that. And then as you're as you get older, you're like, whoa, man. There's a lot of stuff going on in this movie that I didn't oh, notice yeah. as a kid, you know, Lots the conversations and the acting and stuff. So as you get older, the you grow with the movie and the movie gets better and better. So um, it's been a few years since I watched it. So I refreshed myself on it. Watching it today with a critical eye because I knew we were going to be talking about it. It's just um, it's so rich. It's so great. The set design, the colors, the warmth of the uh, of the set and, and even the warmth of the costumes. I remember like. Because part one, I still think is a really cool movie, but it, you know, it has its problems. The most Star Trek, the motion picture, but they fixed everything that they did wrong in the first one, or that yeah. they kind of were wishy-washy about in the first one, you know, and that movie is very, uh, has a very cold aesthetic, which is cool too. But um, Wrath of Khan just darkens everything up. It adds all this red and adds all this cool atmosphere and everything. And uh, even the way they, the way they, sort of do a double dip like okay the the movie starts off with with just showing the the bridge the bridge crew functioning all these cadets you don't really know they're cadets when it first starts but they're all they're all on the enterprise and they're doing their thing and, and they're doing the kobayashi maru then later in the movie when kirk and the crew come onto the actual ship they get this double dip of showing you like every every angle of the ship which they already did in the first movie, but they do it a little cooler in this one. And then even when they go to the bridge where they open the movie, it looks and feels totally different because of the way they shoot it, the way they act, the way they react to the bridge. Now, you know, they're in the real deal. Yeah. Even though you saw something that looked just like it in the, in the, in the first scene, now it means more, you know? So it's all, all these tricks they do throughout the movie to, to create that atmosphere, you know? Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that particular aspect of things because uh, when I was doing some reading about it, uh, they actually severely cut the budget as compared to the motion picture because that didn't do as well. So they were kind of gun shy and all this kind of thing. So they they, they were forced to uh, recycle a whole bunch of all of the sets of the bridge and uh, other stuff. That there was one space, uh, kind of base. In the first one, I can't remember what it was called, but that's what regular one ended up being was that kind of changed just enough to make it not obvious and mm -hmm. bulkheads and the bridge and uh, the close up scene in regular one was the Klingon ship in the first one. All these all these, all these sort of things. So they were really being savvy and sure. uh, frugal with all that stuff. There was even um, some stuff that they used from the failed uh, Star Trek phase two TV show. Um, I guess they built some sets and did some things and then it didn't go anywhere. So then they used some of that stuff. They spent a ton on the motion picture, uh, just with the, the 15 minute long shots of the ship alone. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> so they had to, they had to cut some budget, you know, like the, the performances in the movie are outstanding, you know, yeah. and, and people like to rip on William Shatner, but I think they kind of miss the point when they do that. I mean, it's funny to do that. It's funny to rip on him and everything, but he's obviously like the perfect person to play that character. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah, yeah. and, and he did it for, for so long and he was, he was great at it. And especially maybe in that movie, maybe that's his best performance probably. And, 
as well as Ricardo Montalban, you know, people use that phrase like chewing the scenery, but I don't know if I really buy that because like, how else should you play these characters? Should you be subtle? Should you, or always be subtle? Should you uh, be quiet and, um, and minimal or should you fucking, you know, go for it like those right. guys do? Oh, you yeah. know, and I don't think it's over the top. I think it's the appropriate way to play those characters. So like they're so good and and and, you know, they just savor it. You can tell they savor every line. Yeah. And it's amazing, too, that they have this they have this chemistry. They have this whole, you know, rivalry and all this hate and they're never on the screen together at the same time. They're right. never standing in the same room. Yeah, not once in the movie. Film. Right. They're they're always on screen. They're always on screens facing each other and, um, you know, or on the comm and stuff like that. And just that alone, there's so much power between those two, those two guys. You could never touch that if they did a live or not a live. If they did a new version of that movie, which they kind of did in uh, back in 2012 or whatever it was um, with the new cast. Of course, they have them face to face constantly. Right. They have them in fighting. Everybody has to, you know, physically fight each other because that's like the modern way to do it. You have to have everything going on. But in that movie, they they uh, they use that restraint, and somebody made that conscious decision of like, no, they're they're never going to be in the same room at the same time, and yeah. we'll see what kind of tension we can get out of it, you know, because of that. And just yeah, that restraint is everything. Sometimes when you don't do something. Uh, it, it's it's more powerful, absolutely. Greg, when's the last time you saw Rathacon? Man, it's been a while, but like I said, it has one of the most traumatic um, scenes from my youth that I remember vividly. Yeah. I don't think anybody forgets it if you see it young. But the right. the Seti eel, uh, yeah, scene, mm -hmm. and he's got all those guys like down on their knees, or I think, and uh, he basically like takes one of the babies out from underneath the scale of the main thing, whatever it is after it nearly tried to like pull the forceps out of his hand. And yeah, you just know how nasty that thing is. And then it, he pulls like the babies out and he's putting them in that little, that little thing. And you know, nothing good is going to happen because he's pulled out like the exact amount of the guys that are in the room <laughs> prisoner, yeah. you know? So, yeah. <laughs> you know, and then, you know, then everybody knows what happens after that. You know, the whole year thing, just very traumatic. What's crazy is like, there's stuff in nature that's sort of like that, you know, like, mm. like titsy flies or whatever. What's that one that, you know, if it bites you it, and then it like grows underneath your skin or something like, right. so oh, yeah. I don't yeah, know. Burrow like, or something like that. Yeah. So like it's route, you know, it's rooted in, in realism, you know, so it's not that far fetched, even though it's a Star Trek movie. That something yeah. could crawl in. I, so I was convinced something could crawl in my ear at night, you know, and <laughs> it was going to yeah. wrap itself around my cerebral cortex. And, <laughs> you know, I forget how he says it, but it basically like wraps itself around your brain and grows until it has no more room and then it exits or something, I think. Right. So, yeah, yeah that I it mean, leaves you susceptible to suggestion. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a hundred percent better than the first one. Mm -hmm. Um, in my opinion. And, and, you know, just look at rotten tomatoes, man. It's like 86% on there. And yeah. that's like, how long has this movie been out? I mean, how many people have seen it? So to have 86% on rotten tomatoes is pretty good. Yeah. It's incredible for sure. You know, so that just tells you how good it is and it's, and it stood up, you know, and it, it's definitely the best star Trek movie. In my opinion, I yeah. never, you know, I was always a star Wars guy. So like, I sort of had this natural hostility towards Star Trek. You know, <laughs> that was my dad's generation. You know, like that's how I saw it. You know, I'm like, it's yeah. not, you know, special effects aren't as good. And I would see it on TV and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is corny. And, you know, so, so the movies actually redeemed Star Trek in my eyes because it became more on par with what I saw in Star Wars. It was at least closer than yeah, when I mean, you compare, it brought it when into you a modern them. age. Yeah, like when you compare the, TV, the Star Trek TV show to Star Wars, there's obviously a, a, a wide difference in technology. <laughs> and uh, But like once they did started doing the movies, it sort of narrowed that gap. And I'm like, all right, well, I guess, you know, this is kind of cool. You yeah. know, and then the whole, you know, ear thing freaked me out. So I was <laughs> like, man, it's got some good, you know, horror elements to it almost. And Right. Or interesting tidbit. 
would uh, is uh, the, the director Nicholas Meyer uh, had actually never watched a Star Trek episode ever when they asked him to direct it. So he came See, at it. That's probably why it's so good. Yeah, he came at it, you know, from a totally different standpoint, not as a fan of it or even have known about it or, yeah. or the intricacies of it or the way the characters traditionally behaved, I guess. Um, exactly. He would have been trapped cool. in that. He would have been trapped in that thing where, where Kirk has to, like, be a womanizer or, or you know what I mean? Like he would have, mm. he would have had a preconceived idea about how it should be. And instead, you know, he came in and just made an awesome Star Trek movie. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that probably contributes to why so much of that movie is like really like an old fashioned sub battle movie. It, 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 right. Of course it's science fiction, but wherever they can get away with it, they kind of analog it down. And, you know, when they have, people running around the ship carrying equipment instead of it just being automated, like automatically where it needs to be, you yeah. know, and when they show them pulling up those floor planks mm -hmm. to get those torpedoes ready to launch, they could have, that all could have been automated and, you know, just in the computer, you know? Yeah, um, exactly. And, uh, but yeah, they show they people They want to go for that nautical uh, feel, I think, you yeah. know, like the crew of a ship, you know? Yeah, exactly. The, so, yeah. I think that's what probably what appealed to Nicholas Meyer is he's like, well, yeah, we can do a, a sub, a sub world war two battle movie in space. Let's do that. You know? So yeah, that, that helps, you know? Yeah, for sure. And uh, we definitely can't forget to mention the, one of the best film scores that's ever been seriously. James Horner's yeah. score to that is just so good. Uh, some unique instruments choices and, definitely unique approaches and timbres that he chose but one one more thing about the movie uh, that we have to mention is like you know the most the most you see when you said it's got the most dramatic scene greg i totally thought you were talking about spock at the end yeah and so yeah the I, ear thing is definitely tra traumatic 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 i got you i misheard you as but the d dramatic like with spock like yeah, man. You know, as a kid, you just can't believe it. And I'm, right. no, I'm sure no adult in the theater could believe it. Right. Um, to see. Excellent choice to do that. Yeah. And it doesn't even matter that they reversed it in the next movie. That doesn't matter. Right. Um, you know, and but it doesn't it, matter. Also, it, was a, it was well done how they did it. It made right. sense. It wasn't cheap. So everything worked. Right. And even if you're watching it for the 50th time, like I did you know it's coming but it's still powerful that's yeah. that's why that's part of why it's so good um and like a, even that little moment you know when i mean it's just so heavy when when kurt comes down there and he can't go in there he can't open the door because he'll flood the whole compartment and yeah and uh they're they're on the each side of the glass so now you have like He's looking at Khan through through monitors. Now he's looking at Spock through glass. They can't even be in the same room together. And then Spock is all messed up. He's across the room. He struggles up, kind of uses the wall to to prop himself up. And then you know that the the coolest thing ever is that he he Straight pulls his tunic. tunic down. Yeah, totally. He man. fixes his fucking <laughs> tunic. Oh my god! Oh, yeah, now I that could not that. have been. That couldn't have been a direction. That had to be Leonard Nimoy's choice. I, I, I hope I never hear anybody correct me on that. Right. That had to be Leonard Nimoy's choice because, like, to throw that in there as he's about to die and and uh, he's all irradiated, his face is all messed up, and struggles over to the to the wall and has that you know amazing scene uh, with with Kirk and it's just yeah. it's one of the best things ever. You can't oh, beat yeah. it. For sure. I'll never forget that last sequence like that is absolutely moving for sure. Absolutely. Oh, and one more thing that's really cool about part two is that it's, it starts a trilogy within the whole Star Trek series. You know, one pretty much motion picture stands on its own, kind of unconnected to the rest, yeah. sort of. And then Wrath of Khan starts this thing and then, Genesis, of course, is a huge part of the of part three, uh, the search for Spock. And of course, they're they're going to recover. Well, they end up going to recover Spock. They don't know he's alive at first, but and then the Enterprise gets blown up. They they commandeer that that Klingon ship, the Bird of Prey, and then that brings you into part four, 
the uh, voyage home where they're still riding around in that Klingon suit. They yeah. haven't even had time to change their clothes, right, their civilian right. clothes <laughs> that they had in part three. So they're not even in uniform for for all of part four. All that stuff is really cool. That continuity, the, like those three movies look like they take place within a week or two of each other. Mm-hmm. To yeah. have a trilogy in the middle of a series is pretty unique. Yeah, you know? definitely. All right. It's time for this episode's installment of Collecting Cool Stuff this man, week. Oh, man, I love this Greg. segment. I think Aaron shared something similar that he collects, and I, I kind of put myself above it a little bit. Like, I would never collect those. Mm. Okay. I don't know, maybe. Mm. Oh. So I changed gears, and I wanted so maybe, to let Maybe Aaron, some thoughts. I, you Okay, go ahead. Oh. I wanted to let Aaron know that I'm officially in there you go man if yeah, you're gonna you, get oh, one that's I, yeah, the you one that you were never gonna get any of those pops those fun codes yeah, exactly that's what yes. i'm saying i put myself above it but now nah, you're in it there you go my mom got this for me for christmas man, so that's nice. the one to get man god dang that's awesome so here that's let cool. me take it out of the box real quick oh jeez. <laughs> Oh God! Hold on, I gotta get it out of the box. It sounds here. like an elephant falling down a mountain. Oh my God! It's oh, a very noisy geez. box. Hang on. <laughs> oh, you're killing me! <laughs> there he is. Yeah, that is that. Dude, now look at that. That is early era. That would be from the first album, right? Nice. So yeah, I'm uh, I'm all in there. So now you got to go. get all, now, all of them. All so no, them. wait. Now, yeah, that's the problem. So my mom got me the one. Right. You've taken like, your yep. first step into a larger world. That's right. I was like, you know, mom, not for nothing, but there were four guys in the band. You know? <laughs> 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 oh, man. I mean, See, one, I, have, uh, I have Peter and I have Ace. I need I need Gene. Can I have that Gene? So, so that's why that's why I showed the box because there might be people that collect these. That hold on, I gotta put this box. Up. Oh no! Oh, oh no! Here we go again. <sighs> Let me put this back in here real quick. <laughs> All right. All right. I put the box back together, you guys. That's oh, why good. I showed the box because it's they got the number on there, one twenty one. Yep. Yep. So I know that there are probably. There might be another Kiss series, but this is what they all look like for this series on the back here. I resisted as long as I could, but my mom dragged me in to the right. Funko See, Pop thing. And I got to say, cool stuff is fun, man. I got to say, once you hold this thing in your hand, you know, it is pretty, uh, it is pretty charming. Yeah, <laughs> it is. All right. Since we are on a film kick right now, Let's talk about something that uh, should be pretty cool. It's the Dungeons and Dragons movie coming out uh, on March 1st of this year called Honor Among Thieves. And um, the trailer came out a little bit ago, I would say probably back in the late fall. But uh, I just revisited it and watched it again. I'm kind of excited about this. I mean, some of it looks like it might be a little bit uh, comedic, uh, you know, because, you know, Chris Pine's kind of, sense of humor speaking of star trek you know he had uh that similar kind of wit uh as 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 his version of captain kirk i didn't mind it i think it worked in that and i think it'll work in this too and uh michelle rodriguez is in it and in case you didn't know she is a, a a huge dungeons and dragons fan and player believe it or not so it's it, it, it it's appropriate that she's in the film and i even looked through the cast and uh See if I could, if I saw uh, Deborah Ann Wall in there, because she's also a humongous Dungeons and Dragons fan, but they, they didn't cast her, unfortunately. Mm. Bummer. <laughs> no Joe Manganello. No, he's not in it either that I saw. I mean, you, you never know. They might have uh, people that they're not announcing. You yeah. know how they do that stuff, but uh, it's not like formally listed on the IMDb site yeah. or anything like that. But th- there's a whole bunch of D&D fans that are actors that you might not even know it. Like, for example, um, Jack Black is a humongous D and D player and fan, and uh, all these guys and gals yeah. uh, have been on different YouTube channels playing D and D, and it, it's like a whole production. They film it, mm-hmm. and there's even like a little bit of effects in there sometimes, and uh, sound effects, and they kind of you know amp up the drama and make it really fun to watch. Um, like to me, it'd be fun to watch D and D. Period. But they. Mm-hmm 
take it up a notch and, and have some production value to it. But I, I wanted to see like who's responsible for writing and directing it because that was you know that would help you kind of decide a little bit of like what kind of film are you going to get. So mm-hmm. there's actually two directors. You got John Francis uh, Daly, and uh, you got Jonathan Goldstein. Now um, John Daly was like the writer of Spider-Man Homecoming. I didn't see that one, but I think people considered that to be excellent, right? It's great. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. So yeah, he he was he wrote some of the screenplay to that. And then Jonathan Goldstein uh wrote some of that as well, mm-hmm. uh, the Spider-Man movie, and he directed Game Night and Vacation. So this guy's a comedy guy, obviously. Yeah, right? I was gonna say the kind of you comedy centric. You mentioned there was a little bit of comedy in the trailer. I felt like there was a lot of comedy. No, there is. Felt like, yeah, there is. I felt like the comedy was through the whole thing. So you know it's going to be like a very, you know, almost like a Ryan Reynolds movie. Everything is smart-assed and, you right. know. Right. That's what I was gathering, self-deprecating, too. Self-deprecating, you know. Right. Humor. And uh, yeah. that mixed with the other big factor to me that I've that the trailer shows you this, you know, it, if you know what to look for as a D&D fan, but they're going to show you all these things that you've loved about D and D over the years, like spells, books. you know, all that yeah. stuff. Like, like you got, you'll get to see what a shield spell looks like, for example. Right. And, uh, you get to see, um, what a mimic the, looks the, like in a gelatinous cube. And, uh, and this funny, I was gonna say you guys saw the cube in there. Oh yeah, yeah. for sure. Know, and and, then, and the owl bear, you get to finally yeah. see an owl bear in, in like, you know, quote unquote real life, you know, mo- you know, motion. <laughs> What's that so um, be fun. Black Panther with like the tail that stings? What is that? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know if I remember what that's called or not. Um, oh, that's Griffin? in there. Is it a, no. a Griffin? No. Anyway, that's in there too. Yeah, yeah. They they, they pack it. They they yeah. they're you know they're trying to give you everything you've always wanted to see, and so I'm excited for that. You know, because yeah. with modern effects, you know, um, it's going to be fun to see yeah. that stuff. And, and uh, they have like the variety of dragons, like the different color dragons who do different yeah. stuff. You know, they, they don't all shoot fire. Right. You know, there's like the acid spitting dragon, stuff like that. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. I showed it to my son today and he was like losing his mind. So it yeah, might see. be a good one for me to take him to, you know, part of the reason we spelled his name the way we did is that you can jumble up the letters and it makes the word dragon. So. Oh, nice, man. Nice. nice. He's yeah. he's super he's super into it. So hopefully there's not a lot of swearing or no, <laughs> like there won't it, be. It look it look like comedic violence. So I think it's probably yeah. okay for him. Yeah, yeah, I would say so for sure. I don't think it's going to be like super gory or anything. I mean, maybe somebody no. gets like burned by a, a a dragon, but you don't really see it. So right. hopefully, hopefully he can watch it because he watched the trailer and he was like, he's like one more time. <laughs> yeah yeah it's awesome so i had to play it twice in a row for him <laughs> and the uh the score should be great um i can kind of already imagine what it's going to be like it's going to be very symphonic and uh big uh and low horns when the when the enemies are on screen which is it's all good you know it's just trying to convey a point but uh the composer is uh lorne balf uh who did like terminator genesis and the last couple of mission impossible films and even black widow so he's definitely um experienced and and knows how to handle these epic adventures so i think the score will fit right in you know how it's supposed to sound basically yeah cool. so we should uh we should go see this on opening weekend i think for yeah. for, for, for to uh to further our D spirit for this year right that'd be awesome we'll have to see if we can get scout or bob to uh i mean to come with at us the too. very least we're gonna get to have some popcorn right Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I I don't even know if or how the response was when the trailer first came out or you know what the overall uh, impression is of it. I kind of don't care. Like to me, I want to see it. You know, I've always yeah. loved D&D. I've been playing it since I was a kid. And uh <clears throat> I'm in. I'll check it out. I think it's kind of in general like a cautious optimism. Okay. I think people are a little, you know, weary of or leery of the uh humor kind of like we are yeah but right still i'm gonna see it anyway so yeah you know Hopefully, like the hardcore you know. D fans are probably real worried well to me yeah, but they should also be encouraged because they did the detail of putting all those lore things in there yeah you know? right mm-hmm. that so. mixed with 
you know, think about when you play D&D, yes, there's serious moments, right? But what are you doing at the table? Mostly right. you're having fun and you yeah. are talking like Chris Pine, Pine is talking to each other at that, at the table sometimes. Right. So yeah. and I think, to me, it just, it's, it's what you're doing when you're playing. So I, I wasn't jarred by that so much. Like maybe some other people are, I, I, I'm in. Yeah. I'm a, yeah I kind of got that feeling too, that that is the kind of banter that you'd have at the table, you know? Yeah. <laughs> All right. We have some Voyager three news to knock out real quick here. Uh, we still have a little bit left of the January sale going on at the Voyager three store.com V O Y A G three R store.com. All orders over $35 get free U S contiguous shipping. So get on over to Voyager three store.com and stock up on whatever you've been waiting to get. Uh, another fun bit of news is that we're contributing a track to an indie slasher film called movie theater massacre written and directed by our good buddy ian courtney um we're doing the very last uh final battle cue for the film and uh, we've already recorded it uh and we've already turned it in so soon they should be announcing some information about the film when it's going to be coming out any festival appearances or any um premieres or anything like that so we'll definitely make sure to let you guys know when that's going to happen because it's always fun to see a cool film like that in the theater with a bunch of buddies for sure yes it's always see, fun to see, hang out with ian that's right yeah, man is. see that's we're right. always working people that's right cheers ian we're always take it east <laughs> we're always in the kitchen cooking up something for you that's right and and we never stop we never stop then we have another one that's right man yeah the scored to death camp is uh producing a documentary film all about some of the classic composers of horror films like for example uh henry manfredini uh who else heard of him yes uh alan haworth you may have heard of him as well uh um, bernstein yes uh nightmare on elm street of course uh and uh many more so they're going to do a companion album to go along with this documentary film and uh we are on that record as as well as uh richard christie from uh howard stern show and uh the drummer on the final death album uh and alan haworth as well steve moore from zombie is contributing a track on there and uh right to uh, before moore, the holidays man. oh steve yeah moore. he's he's a home run he's money in the bank everything he does is very tasty and awesome no doubt um and our track because they've announced a handful of the tracks already and one of our and ours was announced as well so we're doing uh a rendition of the phantasm main theme and uh, it turned out great we've already recorded it mixed it mastered it and we've turned it in it is uh turned out really tight we're really happy with that and i think you guys are going to love that track it's so one more uh film that we'd like to mention often because we scored that film uh, new york ninja has a handful of theatrical dates that are happening right now and by the time this podcast airs uh, the final date at the Spectacle Theater is Friday, January 27th, a midnight showing. And that's at 124 South 3rd Street in Brooklyn, New York. Get your tickets uh, at the Spectacle Theater uh, website for New York Ninja. And then if you're not in the Brooklyn area, on the movie channel, on Sunday, January 28th at 4 a.m., uh, it's going to be playing on the movie channel. So uh, mark your calendar, set your DVRs, or brew some coffee and check out new york ninja i have to i have a wardrobe change that i have to complete before we transition all right <laughs> so I just slid off the screen well you can tell by greg's hat that our final topic of this v3 cast is about the brand new obituary album which is yes. called dying of everything and it came out on january 13th of this year so it's fresh and new as it gets man so uh we're here to it's tell no you secret it it's is no awesome secret. it's no secret that this band is a fan of obituary oh yeah yes. man for sure ever since i heard cause of death i i've loved them ever since and then i went backwards to to uh to slowly rerot and then kept going with every album they put out so was good. cause of death the first one you heard didn't you yep. hear my slowly we rot i don't think so i think i heard cause of death because i uh 
that was it in was the, cause of death for me is yeah, that the, right. the spider webs on the, on yep. the, on the uh, that right. was the yeah. era I, where where i would get something like a cassette because the cover looked great and i got yeah. that i'm like oh my god this is outstanding because at that point i'd only ever heard probably spiritual healing maybe uh that pestilence album with the, the ants on the guy's face consuming impulse and maybe that one suffocation album as far as death metal goes so yeah. when I saw that cover, I'm like, yep, I got to get this. I, I got to spend my, my allowance this week and get that cassette. Loved it. And then you had um, Slowly Be Rot. And then yeah. we, we we heard that too. And we're like, oh my God, especially the track Till Death with the flange on the scream. Oh my God, doesn't so get better good. than that. Jesus Christ, it's so good. <laughs> um, I think the new album, well, I was going to, kind of build to this but why why wait i th I think it's the best one of the modern era like since they got back together definitely and, uh I think yeah. it was 2004 with um with frozen in time i've liked all the stuff they've done since they got back together i think the all those albums are good and some of the stuff is great but i just feel like they had more fire in this album like i agree like you can i i feel like you can hear the difference between them saying well, we're going to do another album. Let's do a new album. And them saying, you know, like, let's fucking destroy this place. Right, you know, like, right. that's what this feels like. It Let, feels like they have a bit of a chip the bar. on their shoulder. Yeah, raising the bar. It feels like I like a band when a band has a chip on their shoulder, not like to not toward anybody, not focused at anybody, but just when it sounds like they have something to prove. And it sounds like Obituary just wanted to grab the metal world or the death metal world by the throat, you know, with this album. Yeah. And I think they did it like, man, there's so, yeah, there's so much great textures on, on here and stuff you haven't heard them do at least right. not recently or at all. Like for example, right. what's, up with, the, what's up with the speed of that first song? It's so right. fast for obituary, but it works. It's great. And then yeah. there's a song, um, well, the single that, uh, that they release with the great like cinematic toms with a ton of a long reverb tail on them stuff like that in the beginning yeah, and, and some the kind end. of oh, low so horn great. low horn with that too in the beginning of the song yeah yeah it's totally cinematic 100 percent. and it's like that like to me that's like them uh reaching back to like uh world demise mojo or you know they don't mind if they're going to add like machine gun fire to right. um the, the the beginning of a track that that's okay like would a death metal band do that probably not but obituary is and it's gonna yeah. be fucking awesome <laughs> right right i think um there's so many great rhythms and so many great riffs and just they've always been a really rhythmic band with the way the guitars and the drums work together oh yeah and i feel like they're they they came up with some of their best stuff on this album and and lyrically i think this is like definitely the best lyrics he's written in the last 20 years i mean like yep. he, he has so many great little phrases like yeah you know when he's like um i'll put an end to you without conscience without you know uh, and uh, i'll take you to war you know that, yeah. that that war song with the with the machine guns yeah yeah um there's so many great little little things he throws in there and it's like yeah he just sounds like he had more to say on this album which i know sounds kind of silly because it's it's obituary so like a lot of times you can't even tell what he's saying you right, know? right and then he has a reputation for just making sounds sometimes that aren't necessarily even real words or or they're completely indecipherable but i don't know i hear what he's saying more in this album and it sounds yeah. like he's just like he just was a little a little more determined you know a little more yeah. focused or something and uh the introduction of well not not the very first time but uh guitar harmonies in on, on this record that they're not they don't typically do that that much yeah. but this one has like quite a bit and mm -hmm. uh i don't mind that either it's not jarring to me i don't feel like oh what's obituary doing no nah, man it's perfect and it's just right. a little added like a couple extra different color crayons on the box in this box and you're like oh yeah man i, I always wanted orange obituary right. never did orange now i yeah. got it <laughs> yeah that's the thing like they have this reputation of being i've heard people call them like the acdc of death metal i don't think that's true though i mean maybe sometimes it is but this album they broke out of some some sort of habits now there's plenty of traditional obituary on the album yeah but they they definitely put up some new things that you wouldn't necessarily expect from them even the intro to um what is the one um 
Oh, the dying of everything. The title track, like this, yeah. the second song they put out uh, oh, as yeah. a single. That rhythm. Got, yeah, that snare. That stop. Bop, bop, blah, yeah. bop, bop, that snare. They've never done a, a beat like that. That like that Anthrax kind of beat. They've never right. done that that I can remember. Oh man, yeah. And uh, I'm I'm bummed I couldn't make it to that show that was here at the uh, at the State Theater. That was a Mono Marth was the headliner, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah that was, that was Aaron and I were there. Was, you know, I don't know, but thank you for great. the t- for the uh, not not Snapchats, TikTok, but the Snapchat videos, man. I, I appreciate yeah, man. that. I felt like I was felt like close as I, I, I close as I could be to being there. <laughs> well, they're gonna have to come back this year for the new album because the album wasn't even out yet when they came. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. so um, they'll have to be back. I'm sure they will. Hopefully, sure. in St. Andrews, that would be perfect. Oh, it sure would be, man. Oh my God, that would be the best sound. Um, mm-hmm. Drums would be thunderous. Yep. Oof. Speaking speaking about what you said earlier about. Uh, you know, like the having the fastest song, that thing that I sent you guys today that Don Tardy said, you know, yeah. what the hell am I thinking at my age? Yeah. Right? yeah. If, Why did I write that, that like that? <laughs> if, yeah. If you read the article, he's like, yeah, you know, we were in the studio, we were having fun. You know, I was really trying to push myself. And then he goes, then the reality set in that I'm going to have to like play this <laughs> out on tour. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah Cause I mean, it's pretty up tempo for a, for your typical obituary. They don't usually go right. that fast. For sure, right, but it right. sounds great, and I he, and love I love that I love that he can still do it. I mean, he's so rock solid. Like he he well he is such an I, I he's such an identifiable part of the band. However you want to call, it. he's the identity of the band. So is his brother on vocals, and yeah. you could hear. And so like, is Trevor's guitar tone. So, Trevor's yeah, guitar right. tone. They all, they're all bringing it. <laughs> right, you could you could play. I mean other people have said this too but you could play any any part of any obituary song from any album and anybody would know anybody who knows this kind of music would know that's obituary you could yeah. never mix them up with somebody else even without the vocals going you'd know it was obituary just by the drums and by the tones you know oh yeah for sure man absolutely couple things about obituary definitely top five best death metal vocalists of all time yeah. there's there's no arguing it like he is instantly identifiable and that's hard yeah. to do when you're doing that sort of voice right mm-hmm. but but you automatically know it's him there's a few other people you can say that about i think barney from napalm death is one of them yeah like you always know it's him you you know you always know but instantly identifiable definitely top five death metal vocalist of all time like he's in he's right in there with anybody else you know yeah. some people say lars from uh entombed would be one of them that you instantly know but like yeah. some of these guys have managed to carve out a way of of doing that sort of vocal you know to to the point where you just know it's them the other yeah. thing about obituary that you already mentioned is his brother and on the drums uh and the groove that obituary has that they always have it's instantly mm-hmm. like you mm-hmm. know it's them he comes from the same school of drumming as uh, Bill Stevenson from uh, Black Flag and Descendants. Like he's got that little bit of pause. We always talk about it. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like, it's like, you know, people talk about playing in the pocket. Those guys are playing in like the deep pocket. Like, right, right. He it's, pushes it's, that it's four. All, it's like Just right the... to the very <laughs> brink of like, you know, like I don't know how to explain it, but him and Bill Stevenson do the same thing. Like when I watch yeah. them. It's that's what I it, it's like all I can focus on because I'm a drummer, but yeah. like him and him and Bill Stevenson are, are cut from the same cloth. You know, the last thing you already mentioned is guitar tone, but I'm going to go one step further and say Trevor Perez is the most metal looking guy in metal. No, oh, like, yeah. there's nobody that looks more metal than him. Like yeah. I, he's got like we, we always talk about this. There's something about his eyes. Like I remember those early obituary records like. He just personified like the word obituary. He oh, just absolutely, like, man! Yeah, it, like, it looked like a George Romero poster. He looked like, like a honestly. zombie a little bit, and that, yeah. that you know, I, I hope that's not being mean towards no. him. It's just the way he looks, and he's perfect. Yeah. Like he just looks like the definitive metal guy, <laughs> you yeah, know. Right. Like, and now he's got that giant beard to, bur- to boot, you know. Right. Yeah. And it's always cool that he played like a strat and like, right. you know, not a lot of metal guys play strats and it's just, there's so much cool stuff about obituary. 
that makes them unique and doing their own thing, which is, right. you know, what anybody could hope to do in any kind of music. And they, yeah. they definitely have stuck to their guns and do their own thing. And this album, this new album is a perfect example of that. Well, right. uh, we like to thank everybody for hanging out with us on this V3 cast episode 22. If you like Voyager three, or if you like three dudes from a band talking about movies and music and books and D and D and cool drinks, then like and subscribe and hang out with us and you'll know the next time we upload a brand new V3 cast. So until next time, keep on rocking and we'll see you soon. I gotta put. I gotta put him back in the box, though. Oh, oh dear! Oh, no. let, me just, let me just put him away. Editing this first. part out. Oh yeah. No. Right back into the box you go.